If you have your Bibles, open up with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. We will be reading the first six verses from Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, with one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, amen. I invite you to retake your seats, dear brothers and sisters. The human body contains 78 different organs, about 600 muscles, 360 joints, 206 different bones. There are 10 different systems or body systems that control everything that we do, everything that goes on, from the circulatory to the nervous system to the endocrine system to the respiratory to the skeletal and so on and so forth. In our body, we have more than 60,000 miles of blood vessels. If you were to take all our blood vessels, the veins, the arteries, everything that tra every, by which way our blood travels through our bodies, and we were to attach them end to end, it would go around the world over two times. That's what's in our bodies. We have not millions with an M, not billions with a B, but trillions with a T of cells in our bodies trillions of cells in each and every single one of our bodies. What do I want to tell you? What do I want to say with this? All these things work together in beautiful harmony and make you what you are and shows us what we are here today. All the body is interconnected and dependent on one another to function. All our body parts have their own identity have their own characteristics, their own function, their own purpose, but all together are needed to serve and serve one specific goal together. And that is to live, to function. There is a beautiful harmony in all of this and there needs to be harmony. There needs to be unity in all this because everything depends on one another. The fact that we are functioning, the fact that we are breathing, it is all depending on different parts of our body. The respiratory system relies on the circulatory to deliver the oxygen that it gathers. The muscles of the heart cannot function without the oxygen it receives from the lungs. The bones of the skull and of the spine protect the brain and the spinal cord, but it's the brain that regulates where those bones are by controlling the muscles and the functions. This comparison of our body and its parts and all that is within us is a comparison that Jesus Christ, that God himself makes in terms of the image of what the church is and should be. There's a reason why Jesus Christ, why God calls us his body and the way that we function and the way that we are and compares us to each other. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, it says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And just like the function of all these body parts are crucial to the life of the body, so you and I, dear brothers and sisters, so every part of the body of Christ is crucial to the life, to the impact, to the effectiveness, to the growth of the church and the unity and the working together of this body. You see, the word of God asks and shows us here in the text that we read in Ephesians chapter four, there are certain attributes, there are certain characteristics that you and I, the different body parts of the body of Christ must have if we are to keep this unity, this harmony in the body. 
And it's interesting that the word of God never asks us to create unity or to make unity. No, unity is created by God. We are asked to keep, to maintain it. God establishes unity through the Holy Spirit. Unity, as Brother Fatla Kunel mentioned last week, the fact that the body of Christ is united, the fact that we can take people in our church, for example, whether you're born in Oradia or Bucharest or Satumare or Radouts, whether you're born in Chicago or Phoenix, Arizona, the fact that we can take a multitude of people of different ages, born in different parts of the world and keep a unity is a miracle of God. This is a miracle established by God. And in the greater body and the universal church, the fact that there is unity in different churches around the world and in, in the body of Christ, it's a miracle of God. But you and I, the word of God, ask us to maintain, to keep this unity. The Spirit helps us to override our human differences and to maintain a bond of peace through harmony. Praise be to God. Dear brothers and sisters, the message that God put on my heart to share with you and this morning is a message of unity. A message of unity. Something that you and I have our part to help maintain, to help keep in the body of Christ. And there are certain attributes that we must have if we are to maintain it. Three crucial ones that we see here in our text in Ephesians chapter 4 that you and I must have if we are to maintain and add and keep this unity amongst each other. Young and old, rich and poor, men and women, married and unmarried. And the unity and the beauty that we have here amongst ourselves and in all churches should have around the world. This unity must be maintained and kept by his body. The first attribute that we see here in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 2, it says that we must be humble. It says we must be lowly. It says the word here uses with all lowliness, with humility, we must keep the peace. Without humility, without lowliness, dear brothers and sisters, there cannot be unity. If there is pride in our hearts, if there is pride in our lives, if we are prideful people, selfish people, there cannot be a unity kept. If we, learn, if we look to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 states as follows. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. Let nothing, nothing, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Dear brothers and sisters, selfish ambition, as it speaks here, is seeking to put oneself forward or one's own interests and desires above another. Listen to me very carefully. This is a fundamental truth. That it doesn't matter whether it be in a marriage, in a friendship, in a family, in a business, in, on a sports team, in society, in any aspect, in any relationship between people, selfishness is cancer. Selfishness is how you destroy every single relationship. The same way that cancer is detrimental and kills the body and healthy cells, the same way selfishness kills every single relationship. And that is how we destroy churches, through division, through selfishness. Cancer in the body has its own agenda, does its own thing, wants to separate itself and wants to kill the body. That is what a selfish person does to a church. That is what a selfish person does in a marriage, in a business, and so on and so forth. It's important that we remember this, that when we come to church, when we are part of a church, part of the body of Christ, that the moment that we are born again and we are baptized into the body of Christ, that we no longer look out for our own interests only, but that we first humble ourselves, put God at first and foremost, and put others before ourselves as the word of God says. It's important that to keep unity, to keep unity amongst ourselves, church, that we put aside selfish ambitions. And to put aside conceit, as it, says here, as it says here, conceit is vain glory. Conceit is groundless self-esteem. Conceit is empty pride. This means that we don't always know better. I don't always know better than the person sitting next to me in church. 
I don't always know better than the pastor. I don't always know better than the worship leader. I don't always know better than the usher. I don't always know better than the Sunday school teacher. And if by somehow, some miracle I do, I humble myself. I humble myself and I pray for all people and ask that God, if there's something that needs to be changed, if I think I know better in a certain way, if I think that may, not causing going forward with, with an idea or a cause is gonna, is gonna bring myself to evidence, I humble myself and say, God, let you work. I don't do anything out of selfish ambition. I don't do anything out of conceit. This is the attitude you and I must have when we consider ourselves as part of the body of Christ. We put our desires, we put our ambitions down. We put them aside and let God work and let his name be glorified. Dear brothers and sisters, the first attribute we must have to keep the unity of the church is to do everything with humility and loneliness. God help us. Secondly, gentleness, as it says here in Ephesians chapter 4. We cannot keep unity. We cannot have unity amongst each other in the body of Christ if there is not gentleness, according to this word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. The word of God says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Gentleness, compassion, as it says here. Compassion is to feel for people, to suffer with them, to sympathize with them. It says here to have love. The, the word for love here is philadelphos, which means a brotherly love, a, a, a compatriot, a fellow countryman love, a fellow Christian love. Without this brotherly love amongst ourselves, we cannot have unity. Understand that the person sitting next to you, the person sitting across from you, is your fellow brother in Christ. More than a fellow American or a fellow Romanian. They are a fellow child of God, fellow brother and sister in Christ, and we must have this understanding, this realization, this love for one another if we are to keep the unity amongst ourselves. It says here for us to be tender-hearted with one another, which is another word for compassion. It says here to be courteous, which means friendly, which means kind, which I know sometimes it's easy to say something and to criticize and to put people down. It might be the truth, but the word of God asks us to be courteous, to be friendly and kind to sometimes watch and sometimes shut our mouths. Even though what we wanna say is the truth. Maybe it's not the most kind thing. Maybe it's not the right thing to say, especially in certain moments. God help us to be courteous. God help us to be gentle and to bear with one another, to be kind. And God help us to love one another and to show that love, domna juta. Without, without humility, it's impossible to keep unity. Without gentleness, it's impossible to keep unity. And without patience, it's impossible to keep the unity. Long suffering, patience, as it says here in the word of God in Ephesians chapter four, we must have, if we are to keep the unity of peace, we must with long suffering bear with one another. In Romans chapter 15, the first seven verses, it reads, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scriptures of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to, the, to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, we're not here just to please ourselves. We are not here just to, I'm here for my pleasure and for what I desire and for what I seek. We are here to worship together, to glorify God with one voice together, the word of God says. To bear with one another, to have patience with one another, to suffer with one another, to rejoice with one another. Here, it's not about me. 
It's not about you. Here it's about God and it's about us together, the body of Christ, not the body parts of Christ, but the body of Christ in unity. It's not what songs I want. It's not who I think should be preaching or what sermons I think should be preached or what topics I should be preached, how I think the way things should be done. It's not about me, dear brothers and sisters. It's not about you, forgive me for saying. It's about us. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and unity and together. And may God help us to bear with one another and to have patience with one another when someone doesn't see it the same way we do. But to bear with one another, to love one another, and to, and, and to contribute what we can to the unity and to the peace of the church. You see, those who just come to consume, those who come to be pleased are like leeches. Leeches are those little organisms, mostly black and green, in certain bodies of water in certain areas of the world that attach itself to a host and just suck the blood from the host. We are not leeches, dear brothers and sisters, to just suck the life, suck the blood out of a host where we come just to, to, to gain from here. We come to serve, we come to give, we come to worship, we come to bear with one another, to love one another, to pray for one another, to support one another, to be united. We are to bear with one another and to be like-minded with one voice glorify God. And this doesn't mean we just tolerate each other. To bear with one another, to love one another, doesn't mean to just tolerate, like, oh, I, I'll, I'll just put up with them because I have to. No. No, we serve one another. We love one another. We support one another. We seek each other's well-being. This is what it means to be united in patience and long-suffering. This is what it means to bear with one another to support and seek each other's well-being, not just to tolerate and to put up with each other. This is what true unity is, to bear with one another, and God help us in that. Jesus Christ prays for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Did you know that one of the, most, one of the main things that he prayed for you and I before he goes to be crucified is for us to be one, for us to be united, because this is where the power, the essence of the church, where the impact and the effectiveness of the church relies, and the church being one, as he and the Father is one. Let's go to John chapter 17, verse 20. For when Jesus Christ prays for you and I, for his children. John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these also, meaning his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. How can the church glorify God and preach Christ and be a light to the darkness by us being one according to this text? And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, and that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We want to impact the world, amen? We want to be a light to this world. We want to be a city set on a hill. How do we do this, church? Together. Together. Together we impact this world. Together our children know Christ. Together we grow in understanding and the knowledge of Christ. Together we grow in maturity. Together we preach the gospel to our neighbors, to our families, our friends, to our city. Together we preach the gospel and bring the gospel to Romania and Africa and India and wherever God opens the door. This is not done by just you or just me. This is done by us. It is not the work of the elders. It is not the work of the children. It is not the work of a single group. It is the work of the body of Christ, you and me together. Together is how the church functions. Together is how God uses the power of the Holy Spirit and unity to affect the world. And it goes beyond our comprehension, beyond our wildest ashteptad. Uh, I believe that the church is, that our church is here today and has impacted and has been able by the grace of God to bring the gospel to Romania, to Africa, to India, amongst ourselves, that this church has grown from what it was 25 years ago when I moved here. Just a few families in the, in the Kledina next door. That the God has built us up because there was unity. There was love and fear of God. There was respect for one another. There was unity in the body of Christ. Think about how God, not, we can't do this. Father Kuno, I'm sure, will recognize he couldn't do this on his own. He couldn't imagine this. None of us could have imagined that we are where we today. This is done by the power of God in unity. And this was done by a few people. 
And now look at us. Look at the, what, imagine what God can do through his church, through all of us together, if we united 100% with one mind, with one goal. We see God working, but imagine how much more God can do. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, it says that five will chase 100, and 100 will chase 10,000. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30, how can one chase 1,000 and two put 10,000 to flight? How can God do something like this, this law of exponent? By the power of the Holy Spirit, through unity, dear brothers and sisters, together is how we as a church pre- uh, uh, remain. Together is how we as a church endure. Together is how we as a church are Christ's hands and feet and the light of, gospel, of the gospel to this dark world. We are called to be one, dear brothers and sisters. The word of God says here uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, we are to be one in body, in spirit, in hope, in, in the Lord. One faith, one hope, one baptism, one God the Father. We are to be one. Mankind has failed. Christians, forgive me for saying, have failed in many times in this aspect both universally on a global scale with all the different denominations, with all the different misinterpretations of the text and causes division amongst the body of Christ, sadly. And many local churches fail in this unity because they allow age or they allow worship styles or they allow certain doctrine and theologies of maybe one group going off the rails, causing divisions and breaking up churches. Again, there is no church just for children. There is no church just for youth. No church for the rich or for the poor, for the married, for the unmarried. No church for a single group of people. There is just the church. There is just the body of Jesus Christ. And we must live in this and understand this. This is it to be for our unity. We desire for this church to be around for as long as until the Lord comes, amen? We desire that this church may be a place where all people may come to worship the Lord, where the word of God is preached, where the Holy Spirit is present, where Jesus Christ is Lord and is working until the day Christ raptures our church. We want our children to be here. We want our grandchildren to be here. We want this to be a healthy, godly church until the day of his return. But without unity, this will not happen. Without unity, it will not last a decade, let alone 100 years or whenever the Lord Christ comes. Luke chapter 11, verse 17, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, Jesus Christ says, and a house divided against a house falls. Division is how you kill a church. Pitting one group of people against another, one family against another is how you kill a church. The word, uh, Jesus Christ says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And yes, he was speaking about the universal church and the gates of hell will not penetrate this place. But do you know what kills churches more than anything? It's the division within. When so-called Christians and children of God do not keep the unity, not keep the bond of peace, but through selfish ambitions, through their own desires, through their own ideas, they create division. And they cannot pray together no more. They cannot worship together. They cannot stand to be face to face and to pray next to each other. And yet they think that in heaven, they'll be able to be in the presence of God together. There is a contradiction here. Dear brothers and sisters, in conclusion, I know that hour is late, so I'm gonna wrap it up here. There is a goal, there is a purpose, there's a plan, just like the body works for a purpose. All our body parts, everything within us works to a purpose, to live and to function, to be healthy, to grow, and this is our end goal. This is the end goal of the church according to the word of God. It's to grow, to grow, to mature in stature and power and in knowledge. Turn back to Ephesians chapter four, We continue our reading from verse 11 through 16. And with this I end. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 through 16. And he gave him, and he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till when? till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, may grow up, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joint and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. 
every one of us to do our share causes growth of the body for the edifying itself in love. Dear brothers and sisters, we wanna be equipped. It's impossible without unity. We wanna be edified, but it's impossible without unity. We want to know God, but it's impossible without unity. We want to become perfect. We strive to be perfect, but it is impossible without unity. We don't want to be tricked. We want to know God and, and know the Bible, not be tricked by deceitful doctrines and false teachers, but it is impossible if we not come before God in unity. We want to grow up, as the Word of God said, but it is impossible without unity. Dear brothers and sisters, in this final prayer, let us pray for exactly this, that with all humility and lowliness, with gentleness and with patience and bearing with one another, we may come before God and that he may unite us even more. I believe and I see unity in this church and I praise God for that. I glorify God for what he has done, but I also have hope and I see and we see what God can do when we unite even more and the effectiveness that we can have as the body of Christ in this world that we live in. And I, I leave you with one psalm. I'm gonna read it in English and in Romanian. As a psalm to leave us and to remind us and encourage us one more time. Psalm 133 verse one. Psalm 133 verse one. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. Iată ce plăcut și ce dulce este să locuiască frații împreună. Do you believe this? Do you agree? Slava Domnului. God bless you all. Amen.